What's up, everybody? I'm Stan, and welcome to Detail Comics, where we go over comics in detail. This is a special weekly one-shot where I'm going to be talking about a really recent DC Rebirth event, and that is The Button. So this crosses over between Batman and The Flash and takes place in issues Batman 21, Flash 21, Batman 22... And then finally it finishes off in the spectacular fashion in Flash number 22. So the thing about this particular storyline is that it ties into an artifact that is one of the most talked about and yet one of the smallest featured components of DC Rebirth Universe number one. And it's got a history behind it that we're going to dive into real quick before we start up on the uh, recap. The Button actually debuts and becomes a kicking off point of 1986's Watchmen, written by Alan Moore. And where we see it is actually sitting in a pool of the blood of the comedian right on top of a street grate as it's being washed off by some street vendor. And you later see it in, say, like page number three, where it's actually on the comedian's person as he goes flying out of the window and he's violently murdered as this part of this plot unfolds over these next 12 issues. And it really ingrained itself into the lore of the Watchmen and why it's one of the most commonly associated symbols, a smiley face button with a drip of blood, which is symbolism of the comedian's blood at his murder time. And at that point in time, nobody really realized the relevance of what this could be until they actually implemented it in May 2016's DC Rebirth Universe number one. And this is not necessarily one of the first things that you see, but it's definitely one of the most impactful. So as Wally West makes his way back into the Batcave, trying to burst out of the time stream, uh, you know, escaping the speed force, the lightning bolt that comes following after him embeds itself into the wall and later on Batman finds it as he wedges it out of its kind of hiding place at that point in time and it becomes a central focus for Barry Allen and Bruce Wayne's Batman to try and find out what it's all about. It's also during DC Rebirth Universe number one where we actually see in the epilogue we pan back from space and at this point in time we're towards the end of the issue when we actually see the button first appear and then we pan back and we end up on Mars where a clock, well specifically a time watch, is disassembling itself and kind of has this luminescent blue voiceover uh, that's talking specifically about characters from the Watchmen. And that's the first indication that Watchmen was going to play a significant part in DC Rebirth. And yet, this is the last time that the button was really spoken of until we see Batman 21. At that point in time, as Batman 21 opens, we actually see Saturn Girl sitting in front of a, a smiley face that's saying, hey, you know, take your meds, be healthy. And this is at the point when she actually freaks out. Because if you remember, Saturn Girl is from the future. She is a member of Legion. And she's made a couple of different appearances throughout the whole DC Rebirth scheme over the past year. But she actually debuted in this context in DC Rebirth Universe number one. So she realizes that this is a point in time that she came back to prevent and she can no longer avoid. And it just completely crushes her. And the thing that I want to kind of key in on at this point in time is Superman won't come. So this is a phrase that she utters that indicates that Superman is probably not going to be arriving in time to save the day at a specific event in the future that we still have no context for. And then as things unfold, we immediately go into Bruce Wayne Batman's analysis of the button, which is interrupted by Eobard Thawne as he invades into the Batcave and ultimately just goes to town on Batman himself. And over this scheme, we get not only a countdown clock similar to the Doomsday Clock that we actually saw in Watchmen back in 1986, but we also get a countdown clock for the time that Batman believes it's going to take the Flash to get there. The Flash said it's going to take a minute, and it, we just count down frame by frame in a very similar, if not exactly the same fashion as Alan Moore's Watchmen back in the day. This whole frame structure of nine panels per page, very dense in terms of its pictures, but it tells the story very systematically. And that's when we get to the point where Eobard Thawn makes his final plunge for the button, picks it up, and is immediately dismissed from that part of reality in a very familiar blue flash. And if we want to understand where that's coming from, the first time that we actually saw this blue flash was in Justice League number 50 of the New 52, where we see Owlman get basically zapped from Metron's chair. And then we also saw it in DC Rebirth Universe number one, and that's what happened to Pandora as she was basically obliterated from the universe. Later on, you had Tim Drake's Red Robin and a number of other characters that were pulled from this main continuity into some sort of storage facility, but we don't necessarily know if that happened to the other characters. Some might have ended up like Ebard Thawne and just simply erased or killed on the spot. However, the most important thing about this scene as it closes is Eobard Thawne mentioning, I saw God. So this gives you the indication that he has actually met the person that was presenting ownership and has this kind of radiation that's resonating from him that is going to 
basically control and manipulate the DC universe at will. They are designing everything from their own structure, and they are going to be the ultimate culprit behind what has happened to these stolen years from these characters. At that point in time, we immediately jump into Flash number 21, where we actually see Johnny Thunder, a former member of the Justice Society of America, screaming the name of his Thunderbolt, trying to become the superhero that he once was so that he can reunite the Justice Society of America. And unfortunately, as it failed in DC Rebirth Universe number one, it fails now, and he's pulled back into this mental institution, not necessarily a mental institution, but more of a retirement home, where he's been living for the last 37 years, and he stays as one of the few people that actually understands and remembers what has gone on when the time was stolen from everybody else. After that opening scene, we end up with The Flash and Batman kind of going over these various forensic things. You know, The Flash expresses relief in the death of Eobard Thawne, but he still has no understanding as to what exactly happened, and Bruce completely comprehends that for Thawne, with his time-traveling abilities, he could have been anywhere. He could have been gone for days in what only seemed like moments for Bruce. And this really gets under the, the Flash's kind of skin, and he seeks out a method in which to travel and trace the actual radiation and the... the path that Thawne traveled in that time. So he goes up to the Justice League Watchtower, and what do we got? Cosmic Treadmill. There's also a number of Easter eggs in the background, but since we're focusing on the button, we're going to stick with the Cosmic Treadmill as the most important thing that he pulls out of this. Of course, Batman isn't going to let the Flash go on his own on this cosmic adventure, so he lashes himself to the Cosmic Treadmill and they take off into DC's multiverse. And what they see are remnants of the past of DC's universe. And they could be considered parallel timelines, alternate histories, and those kind of things. There's not really a lot of comprehension between Flash and Bruce, because this is Bruce's really his first trip that he can remember into the, the multiverse, so to speak, while Flash is a relatively experienced person in that. And what happens? A giant blue bolt of light and he comes crashing down and smashes into the cosmic treadmill or just barely grazes it and it just crushes it and it throws them into one of these alternate timelines, which happens to be Flashpoint. So cue Bat Dad on that one. We see that this universe has actually been in existence for several months at this point in time. Uh, Aquaman and Wonder Woman, who were waging war that was destroying the actual Earth as they know it, they actually kind of came to an agreement and, and they sounds like they're going to be king and queen. Uh, you know, King Arthur of Atlantis and Queen Diana of New Themyscira. And they have sent their armies or their minions after Thomas Wayne's Batman to take him out and make sure that he's no longer an issue. And at that point in time, that's exactly when Flash and Batman drop into the Batcave of the Flashpoint universe. After some really great kind of back-to-back, -back, uh, you know, back and forth between the different characters, we actually see the Batman kind of team up and go kick some ass without the use of guns. So, you know, Batman is having an influence on Bat Dad and it's pretty great. And then since they're in the Flashpoint universe, they're really only in the Flashpoint universe for probably 20 to 30 minutes before we get to the conclusion where the Flash, in about a minute and a half, fixes the cosmic treadmill. It starts to ramp up on its own and they're forced to go out into the cosmic kind of nothingness at that point in time. And we get a really dramatic moment where even though the minions of, you know, Aquaman and Diana's uh, Wonder Woman at that particular universe, they've been defeated and there's no real threat or danger, Thomas Wayne pushes Batman into the cosmic treadmill, forcing the Flash to take him along and tells his son, don't be Batman, let Batman die with me, which is a very heartfelt kind of sentiment that is probably going to be carrying forward into Batman's kind of thought process as we see in the future. However, that is still yet to be seen. As Flash and Batman jump into hypertime, they actually run into Eobard Thawne on his way to visit this god of his, you know, the owner of the button. And that's where we end, you know, in Batman 22. But that is immediately picked up in Flash 22. This is a situation where we actually get another voiceover, another kind of narration that's going on here, and a name calling out from the hypertime, you know, calling out from the Speed Force, looking to reach out to Barry. And Batman hears it, and he's like, yeah, you know, my dad was real. you got to follow into this, Barry. But Flash is concentrating way harder on where the reverse Flash is headed and how he can kind of cut him off before he ends up dying in the future that they have already seen. However... Eobard Thawne, being who he is, doesn't want that to happen. Is just looking for ways to mess up Barry's life. And immediately, as soon as he notes where he is going, where the radiation trail stops, he snaps his fingers, causes a sonic boom, and throws the cosmic treadmill off course as he dives into this pocket universe or this, this time outside of space or the space outside of time, you know, however it really is. There's not a lot of details given, but what he does is he comes face to face or face to whatever with the supreme being this this god this entity that is in control of everything and it's 
emits this very familiar kind of blue light. And at that point in time, as he looks up at this giant being of power and, and is trying to say, yeah, I am the baddest, I am, I am not going to be erased, no one can kill me, not even... Oh, shit. And then, poof, just like bathed in blue light and just started melting before your eyes. Then, at that point in time, Batman is basically convinced the Flash that he needs to call out to this person, call out the name Jay. And what we see is the resurgence of Jay Garrick. The first Flash comes out, grabs Batman, grabs the Flash, and just uses every bit of energy that he has to force them out of hypertime and smashes back into the Batcave as soon as Eobard Thawne's body had been dropped. So it was essentially like they were back at the beginning. Before they ever started the investigation, they were at that moment in time where they needed to be in order for continuity to continue. And as Barry reached out for Jay Garrick to try and drag him back into the DC Universe, he was immediately bathed in blue light and electricity, and just, it looks like he was starting to get torn apart, but I wouldn't necessarily count Jay Garrick out yet. He's probably going to make an appearance later on as uh, maybe a famous superhero team comes back from the dead. And this is where we kind of end the story. Even though we had that climactic moment, everything from here kind of winds down until we get to the final pages before the epilogue. Because we see the acceptance of Barry Allen. He knows that Eobard Thawne is no longer with us. He's not sure exactly what that means. He's not exactly sure what that means for the future. But he feels like this is going to be the conclusion of that point in time and that there might be no one left to chase. However, Batman's not so sure. You know, knowing this entity's out there, knowing that he had the ability and the power to kill Eobard Thawne, the reverse Flash, that the Flash hasn't been able to defeat pretty much ever. And he is highly suspecting that. He wants to know more about what happened to his father, know more about what happened to the Flashpoint universe, and know who is this person pulling the strings and causing him pain. And that's where we start to see the button. The button sitting on the ground of this particular space outside of time or time outside of space, whatever it really is. And a powerful, almost omnipotent blue hand reaches down to reclaim his property. And that can only be described as the hand of Dr. Manhattan from the Watchmen universe. And what we see is that very familiar kind of blue voiceover text that we saw in DC Rebirth Universe number one where he's talking to Lori and about his perception of time and how we're all puppets. It's just that Dr. Manhattan can see the strings. And that's where we conclude that button storyline, but we do get one more hint, and that's the epilogue, where we see the button kind of floating throughout space as it kind of zooms in and zooms in on the red and the yellow, and then it pulls back and it is transformed into the logo on Superman's chest, and then immediately it's followed by the notification that there is going to be a doomsday clock issue. You know, it's got the doomsday clock and the countdown to midnight is Superman's logo. So that means in November of 2017, we're going to be seeing some very serious things happening from Jeff Johns, Gary Frank, and then a number of others that are going to be contributing to this Doomsday, Doomsday Clock kind of mini-series that is really going to dive deep into a conflict, what appears to be, between Dr. Manhattan and Superman. So that's the breakdown of the button storyline that covers Batman 21, Flash 21, Batman 22, Flash 22, with a little bit of history from DC Rebirth number one, as well as Watchmen. So, uh... I want to know what you guys think, and if you've got any kind of crazy theories about how those things are going. I want to know if you guys have seen any kind of Easter eggs that are really cool, because I've got a list of about 25 to 30 that I might be making a video on. As always, if you like what you see, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe right there to get more news, reviews, and commentary on comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.